Bobbisch. Guten Morgen, Berlin! <laughs> Those of you who know me probably know me from my research on programming languages or my contributions to Haskell, um, or maybe more recently from the development of a smart contract substrate for the Cardano blockchain. But I, I've always also been fascinated by um, uh, writing applications for mobile devices and in particular iPhones. And as you know, we had to do this uh, in Objective-C um, uh, in the beginning. And, and still, I mean, I, I was interested enough, I, I did Objective-C, but then nearly exactly 10 years ago, Chris Lettner at the Apple Developer Conference announced Swift. And I was like, what? <laughs> and downloaded the, the language definition, Redwood, and so forth. Oh, okay, they actually knew what they were doing. So, I, I mean, I, uh, programming language researchers, they're always very critical of the <laughs> programming language. So I, I really was like trying to find the flaws, but I, I thought, okay, this is actually not bad. And now, we are 10 years later on uh, Apple platforms, uh, so this is the de facto standard. Uh, but outside that admittedly quite large community, people don't talk a lot about Swift. And um, that's strange, because it's actually a cross-platform language, runs in all major uh, operating systems. It's, it's uh, all open source software based on LLVM. Uh, also, the language development is completely open by the public community. Uh, it's, it's no longer this Apple thing anymore. It's a multi-paradigm language, the kind of language is popular kind of every three years, there are three new ones. And, um, but in contrast to many um, uh, of the competing languages, if, if you see it as a competition, it actually is really concerned about performance. And that, of course, has to do with its origin. On, on a mobile device, you have to be careful, you have a battery run. Uh, out of energy, uh, you don't have that much memory, and so you have to be a bit more careful. But, most of all, it's really great language to, for functional program. And that brings me to my first question. Who here would consider themselves a functional programmer? And you don't have to be afraid, this conference has an <laughs> end of discrimination policy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, that's good, because I, I have another question. What, what's actually a functional program? I mean, it's not that easy anymore. In the past, everything seemed a bit more simpler, right? That's what the politicians also tell us. And, and these programming languages, well, once upon a time, functional programming was about functions, and of course you had to add closures and higher order functions, and that was really the distinguishing feature. But now, even Java has this stuff. <laughs> so it makes it a little hard to, to kind of... So, um, yeah, let me tell you what I think. Um, I, I think really, well, it's of course about functions, but it's really about a certain set of idioms, programming idioms, programming blocks, Lego blocks, um, which go together to make for safe programming style about if it's hopefully easier to reason informally, informally, which together form this mystical function program. So what I want to do, I want to go through some of these idioms with you in Swift, and then we're going to deep dive into two of those. And I'll try to highlight what's special about Swift and how it's actually a, a very powerful function program. But let's start with the basics, namely functions, because we do still need functions. Um, okay, so this is an, an, an array, leg bound, so this is good. A leg keyword already is good stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, it also got a type, which I didn't have to write down, so obviously we have got type inference, gets even better. Um, then, of course, we have collective operations, so here's map function. Uh, 
And for all those Haskell enthusiasts in the, in, in, in the audience, I kind of had Haskell code for some of the stuff, so it's easier to, to understand what's going on here. So this is obviously a lambda x to x plus 1. And there are a lot of brackets, which is annoying. So if the last thing, the argument to pass to a function is a closure, you can leave the wrong stuff away. And this was a toiling closure. Uh, these days in Swift can even be more than one, but this is too much. Okay. But we use this weird dot notation. We'll see later why. Um, there's sectioning. So if we have a function and we only want to pass a few arguments, we can selectively uh, replace some of them with dollar some number. And that gives us a function with, in this case, one argument. Um, but it's quite convenient because we don't need this flip business from Haskell because we can do it in output. And we can just pass a function as such, and we can do this for more complicated stuff too. So this looks like, okay, well, this kind of good notation, but otherwise looks like decent functional code. All right, so what about types? So I'll get into structures a little later. Now, like many la languages for built-in stuff, there's the actual definition, and then there's special purpose syntax to make it more compact. So for arrays, we have that. And then the type of map is something like that. So obviously, there are generics, uh, meaning parametric polymorphism for the uh, connoisseurs um, in, in Swift. Uh, so this is a type variable we quantify over. And, uh, and then we have a function from element to t. And you have to put the brackets here, even if it's only one argument. And, um, and then we get a new array of t's. OK, not too bad. A little different order, some weird brackets. OK, <clears throat> so now actually it's more complicated because Swift is very, very particular about, about everything, also exceptions. And exceptions have to be in the type of a function. And a function that can throw exception has to have that in the type. So this function which I pass as an argument can throw an exception, which means the map itself can also throw an exception because it doesn't catch everything this element processing function um, my throw. So you have these rethrows. So if you like these throw rethrow annotations like a sort of monad exception monad wrapped around the results of all the things where it's at the arrow. Uh, so so okay and this is very strict. So the compiler checks this if you try to throw somewhere where it's not in the signature you get a, a, a error message. Stricter than Haskell, I could say. Um, so, second thing, we need functions, but we need data types. So, data types, we have products. Now, they are called structs. So, Swift likes to, Apple and Jean, but in particular Swift, what they did, they did a lot of rebranding. They took functional programming concepts and then they gave them names which are less scary to normal <laughs> programmers, whatever that is. Um, so instead of a product, we call it a struct. Everybody can handle structs, but only some people can handle products. <laughs> okay, in Haskell it's this. That's no surprise. Then, for sums, obviously it's enumerations. Now, every language has structs and enumerations, so why am I going and talking about this? Because we can have arguments to cases which are called associated values in Swift, <laughs> and that's just your normal product sum type, which is parametric in this case, or a type variable. So, okay, that looks reasonable. Um, now, this can also be recursive. So we can have our usual binary tree definition for our parametric binary tree, where in the leaf we have one of the elements, and in the nodes we have two subtrees, and it's a recursive definition. But, I did say Swift is resource conscious. So actually, Swift goes to a lot of effort to make sure all these things are represented in an unboxed manner. Meaning, no pointer to a heap structure, but really in the registers or on the stack, the actual binary data. Now, that makes the recursion be problematic, which means you have to be explicit about it. <coughs> so you have to say, this particular enum we actually want to have a pointer to this thing because then we can use it recursively. So we can have all the goodies, but we have to be a bit more explicit about it. 
All right. So we have function, high order functions. We have algebraic data types. Um, let's look a little bit more at these uh, data types. So if we want to use one of these structs, we have constructor. Uh, and we can bind it to the value to variable. And then we can define a function on it, length function. So you see one thing about Swift inherited from Objective-C is everything is kind of labeled arguments. You, there's ways to leave the label up, but usually you have these labels. Um, and well, this is just a length function, no surprise here. And then we can call that. But this is not what a self-respecting Swift programmer would write. What self-respecting Swift programmer would write, they would put this thing into the struct definition as a kind of method on, on that struct. And because it doesn't need an argument anymore, because the only argument was itself, um, we, or is now itself, we can make this into what's called a computed property. So a bar, but it actually does a computation, it doesn't have storage associated to it. OK, this is what the Swift programmer would write. And then the, you call it with documentation. Why are we doing this? Because Swift app uses, like many, of all inspired languages, app uses data structure definitions as namespaces. You have only one global namespace, more or less, which you don't want to pollute, so you put all these function definitions into uh, data definitions in order to namespace them. Okay. So, <clears throat> now let's look at, at this vector. Uh, so this is a lag binding, so obviously if we try to override it, the compiler is unhappy. But there is also variables in Swift. So if you make it a var, compiler is happy. Now, if we try to, even it's a var, and we try to just change one component, compiler unhappy again, because there's lag here. So we have to make this into a var if this should work. So we have quite fine grain granularity control. It's a bit like con stuff in Rust. So um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll come back to this. So I said I, I go over some of the main function program idioms and then we do deep dive. We will deep dive. Let's talk about types. So we had this option. Well, this is maybe. Obviously, they are generic, so parameter polymorphism, we talked about type inference, and there are no null types, like in every self respecting function programming language. Right? So, if you want a null pointer, if you want a null pointer kind of thing, well, you have to use maybe, uh, I mean, optional. So, this doesn't work. You have to put an option around it, then it works. Now, because this happens a lot, we have special syntax. Question mark is optional. And instead of none, we can call it new. Um, so that's nice. Now, even if we assign an, a, 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 a sum, meaning just thing, to that optional string, we don't have to put the sum in because compiler infers that for us. Now, if we want to use such a type, well, we have to do pattern matching. Pattern matching is boring. It's like in every other function programming language. Um, but this is also very verbose. So there's actually, for, for optionals, there's a shorthand notation with lag, which only goes into the body of the lag binding if this is actually not near. And because inventing a new name here only to use it once is a bit silly, you can actually write it like this. And then it's quite common. All right, so no null pointers. That's good. That's, that's very good. Um, but also we'll get back to this because there's more goodies to have in tight land. Um, now another thing we are, and this is really actually something which is still evolving, where Swift is very light, particular about static checking, is concurrency. Because, well, uh, I told you, you, you write iPhone apps with this thing, and to write anything on a mobile device without a lot of multi-threading, if you want a responsive user interface, totally, completely impossible. So you have to have a lot of programmers write a lot of concurrent code. It's usually a good way for disaster. <laughs> <laughs> so Swift tries to kind of control the disaster area. 
Um, so it uses, I don't, I'm not only going to say a few things, I'm going to go into detail. It uses, I think, a way style um, of, of programming, um, but it's fully tracked, uh, tracked by the uh, touch letter. So like with exceptions, if you want to use multi-threading in a function, you have to put it into the type signature. And that propagates through. So it's like, again, a concurrency monad, which is being tracked by the patcher, um, which is good. And then, because Swift also has classes, we'll see classes in a moment, um, there is a, con a concurrency equivalent for it, which is a form of actor um, abstraction, which is basically a way to guarantee uh, single thread access to all the state captured in a class or actor. And then finally, on the type level, you can annotate types as safe for being sent, which means you can move them from one thread to another. And typically, anything that's mutable is not safe to send to another thread because then you have rest conditions, which we don't want. So there's a lot going on here, and this is still, as I said, under development. So um, at the moment, the sendable stuff, for example, you can choose between you want you want to have strong conformance, then it's very picky, or less strong, then you can still do something. Um, but I think it's quite interesting also to watch for people interested in language design, um, what they're doing here. Okay, deep dive. Let's look in more detail at mutability. So, um, <coughs> we had this example uh, earlier. So, what I explained before is that using var versus let, we control mutability of individual fields or variable bindings. But there's more to this story, because there are two kinds of types in Swift. There are value types and reference types. And so far, we've only seen value types. So, that's the... Um, struct, enum, algebraic data types of Swift. Now, the difference between those are, if you like, all handling of value types is by value, whereas all handling by reference types is by reference. Which means, if I've got a by value vector, and then I assign it to another variable, and I don't use let here, I only use variables, and then I mutate the second one, and I print the first one, it didn't change. So this is value semantics. Stuff gets copied. This is a value copying, not references, pointers being passed around. In contrast, if I, if I have class, and um, I do the same thing, one vector, and I assign it, then the same happens what you would expect in, say, Java. And, of course, the original thing did change by modifying uh, the copy to the, to the point, I feel like. Now, interesting is, in, this holds in exactly the same way for functions. <coughs> um, <coughs> ah, but I forget to point out, even if we let bind this here, we can still do the assignment uh, down here, because we let bound the reference not the stuff inside. We could use let here on the x, then I could do this. All right, so, but I said functions. So if you define a function, which is the function which zeroes out the x component, and I pass this class-based vector to it, then um, calling this function will change the original uh, value. So this is exactly what you expect in a, in a class-based language, right? If I do the same thing with this struct, it will not change. So now I get a language where I, I can do the kind of class-based reference parsing thing, but I can also choose not to do that. And the rule in Swift is, whenever you have to define a data type, try to do it with a struct. If you cannot do it with a struct, because A, you need a notion of stable identity, which requires some sort of pointer, 
or you actually need this semantics, then you use the class. But the default is to do the function. Now, <clears throat> it, this has some implications because I said data type definitions are used as namespaces and the functions operating on data types go into the structure definition. Now this length function is harmless because it doesn't modify anything. Let's do a function which is still harmless because it's a pure function. So this is a method defined on vectors which gets a second offset vector and then it translates, it moves the first vector corresponding uh, to what we passed as an argument. Now this returns a new vector, pure, fine, no problem. But if you want to define a function which actually, because they are bars, we should be able to change them, right? Actually, in place, updates x and y with the <coughs> modified values, then I have to say that. I can do that. Just like I can choose to put here bar instead of let. But I have to be explicit about it. I have to say this function is actually not pure. Okay, so now we have annotation of purity at uh, function definitions. That's pretty hardcore. That's kind of <laughs> smells like Haskell. <coughs> okay. So <clears throat> now when we use this, then I mean, this is the only consequence out of all the things I said, but I want to make it very clear this in case. Sorry for people in the back, you can't see this, but I, I, I say what, what, what's on the slide. Uh, it's a bit low. So here I'm, I'm creating a vector and I let bind it. And on that vector I invoke this move method. And then the compiler gets very angry and says, cannot use mutating member on immutable value. Mm. Now you've got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, very precise, everything is tracked, and you have to be explicit about where you change things and where you can't. You can always choose to, but you have to be explicit about it. All right. So, of course, if I do a, use a bar binding instead of let binding, compiler is happy with me using move. All right. Question? Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, <coughs> So I don't do Swift at all. Um, That's it's okay. quite, quite similar to Rust. Uh, I have a question about the, the fact that it seems you are you are using the same syntax to do a, a bind value and a bind reference uh, passing. So is it not sometimes confusing when you're writing? Okay, of course the compiler will tell you. Uh, I mean, we'll we say value, but when you reading code and writing code, can, is it not somehow confusing to not know ex whether or not you are man manipulating a value by Restricted by value or by reference? Um, good point. Like there, there, there is no, 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 I totally get what you mean. So the point is basically given that mutability is controlled by the how you define a data type, when you use it, you just need the name, you don't know how it's defined. Isn't it confusing sometimes? When can, can I modify something? When can't I modify something? The, the, this is certainly the case in so far as you have get used to this style so that you you already anticipate uh, that that this possible ambiguity is um, present but it's I would say given this talks about function programming very typical of the function style you you try to encode this information um, in the type and then the type is a guide for what can I do with the thing or can't I do with the thing so Swift follows that tradition. If you don't like that tradition, you won't like Swift, because Swift really goes completely gone hard on it. Is there any sort of user study of the use of bar versus let in, in Swift programs? Because I think being lazy, I would just do all structs with bar and never bother about let. So the bars, um, very often you use bar in structs. But um, because you can't, that doesn't mean a function can modify it. You still have to, and there, uh, people rarely use mutating. Mutating they actually only use when necessary, and they do use let. Um, I'm not aware of actual study. It would be interesting. Um, but in code, you see, you do see lets too. So it's not like, and then it's very much what you would expect. Like the experienced programmers use this much more than the newbies who go like, mm, I don't know, let's make different. <clears throat> All right.
So, um, there's more. Because compound values are typically structs. Now, that's surprising. So, string, dictionaries, arrays, and so on. They're structs, they're not classes. And you can even build your own compound value structs. And that has the implication that, okay, this is easy, and of course we have a subscript operator, but if you try to assign to it, compiler is unhappy, because this is a lead bound value. I can't just uh, modify it. And if I um, pass this thing, uh, well, if I define it as a bar, then I can modify it, of course. And if I pass it on as an argument, then any argument is implicitly lead bound, so I can't change it in the first place. If I want to change it, I have to make a local copy to a variable, and if I then shuffle, kind of move the elements around, destructively update that local array, this won't change the original one. So this is exactly precisely what you want from a function language. But this is basically never provided by non-function languages. Yeah. Is it full copy, or it's copy on write? Or copy it's on write. Copy. So, um, if I want to change this array, well, I have to change it here. And the type of shuffle, of course, is annotated as mutating. So, everybody knows, and the compiler knows, which things you can apply on a lead bound variable and which ones on So, it, there's one more thing on, on, on this uh, mutability story. So, if I nest things, so I have a a new struct with a property which is an array of these vectors and then make an array of these paths, then not surprisingly I can do this thing, right? But in Swift this is first class. So I can define a lambda type, I'm not using this variable, I'm using this type. Then I'm using the same accessor path and I get the value of type writable key path on a path projecting out an int. And it can move this around. And this basically boils down to what lenses provide the Haskell. So it's kind of a lens implementation as part of um, as part of the language. And this is actually very useful for UI programs. Alright. Uh, yeah. Would that also do the return value with only one part mutated? Not, not mutated, but copy the entire structure with one change? So, so if, if you have, there are two types of key paths, key paths which are not writable, they are read only, and then they are writable ones. And writable ones you can only apply to var things, to mutable things. And then it will in place update that one thing. But if I don't want to, for example, you don't want to have a copy of the you one, do one left, change. Yeah. Then you copy, and then you update the copy, and the original stays as it is. So you're not allowed to in-place update any bit bar. Okay. <coughs> so, um, types. So the other thing about types, we saw generics, everything, are protocols. Well, simplest protocol is equatable, which has equality, inequality, and default for inequality, if equality is provided. Well, that's a type in a funny syntax. Now, you can say Java has interfaces, Rust has traits, um, but protocols in Haskell are really type classes, not interfaces. They have things like um, <coughs> uh, deriving mechanism, automatically deriving some type classes. And witness inference, so if you apply a function, the equatable protocol on an array of things and you have a, um, an array implementation, generic one and uh, int one or string one, then it will automatically infer the combination. So it's deriving witness by the type checker. And it has, and that I love, associated types. So given that I, it's one of my contributions to um, Haskell, that we have got this in, in Swift 2. Um, what's an associated type, you may ask, if you haven't done that in Haskell or um, Rust? Um, it's basically a type which you define in a type class. So this corresponding Haskell code. What this identifier protocol may does is provides you identity to any type 
that conforms to identifiable. Because you have to provide a, <coughs> a value, lowercase id, of type capital ID. And the capital ID type is dependent on the type for which I provide identity. So it can be different ID types for different types for which I provide identity. And there's a protocol constraint on that type. It has to be hashable. And when I define my own struct and I want to make it identifiable, and that means I conform to this protocol in Swift speak, then I have provided a definition for this it. And here I use UUIT. This is a, another in standard library type, uh, uniform universal identifier. And the type inference mechanism then determines that this cap capital ID must be the UUID type. So in contrast to Haskell, I don't have to be explicit about instantiation of associated types, but it's inferred when possible, otherwise I have to eliminate it. So let's have a little bit more complicated uh, associated type. If we define a sequence of values, type element, what operation do we want? It? Containment, filter, map, and so on. In different sequences, probably code will be very similar. So we want to write that code once and we use it. So we make sequence bit more general and say, okay, every sequence has to provide an iterator in the sense of Rust or C++ iterator and um, a function to provide that. But the iterator type itself has to conform to protocol, the iterator protocol, which also has an associated type, the elements it provides, and this next function. Well, now we've got a problem. These two elements, they need to be the same. So we need an equality constraint um, on those associated types. And um, now we can use this iterator and provide default <coughs> implementations for all these functions. And then for every type which we um, make conformant to sequence and just implement that function and the corresponding iterator, we get all these functions for free. So that's quite powerful. Um, <clears throat> now, a sequence is a bit boring because it, you, if you use it sequential, you use it multiple times, you might not get the same stuff. Uh, think about the sequence of data from a socket, right? With the times, you get different things. So we want the collection which is sub-protocol of sequence, but it also got an index type. And here we have a type, the index type is dependent on the collection type. And that allows us to have safe subscripts where uh, subscripting is all never going to fail. And so the, the rest of the signature for the protocol is there's a start and index, a way to iterate through the indices, and a subscript operation. Subscript gives the overloading for the square bracket notation. And um, we see here the result is not question mark, because index, when I create the index with these functions, I can only create indices which won't fall when we index the structure with it. So the uh, overflow check is an index computation, not in indexing, in subscribing. Uh, the syntax I didn't understand on the slide. The curly braces would get inside. What does that mean? Ah, yeah, I forgot to mention that. So it means that, um, that this is only read only. If it's get and set, then it's mutable, then it's a read and write. This is part of saying which things are mutable and which are What does it mean to be read-only? You can read through the subject, but you can't update through the subject. Subscript. So start up. Why, is it a, why, 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 why not write let in that case, then, I guess is the question. Um, because this is function definition, and let is for value. But start index and end index have the same modifier. Yeah, here it could be let, okay. but the language, this is a random decision by the language committee to use this get set, and it has something, yeah, that's tradition involved. That's a huge industry. So we get this whole hierarchy of things, which I'm not going to go through, and um, there are also mutability is only, con you, you can choose whether you're <coughs> mutable or not. And um, is it worth it? Ah, this is, by the way, called protocol-oriented programming, which is very much like type class programming in Haskell. But is it worth it? It's very flexible, but it's not uncomplicated. I think it's worth it, because if you could look at Java abstract collection, and you take the add method, you have five 
deal with exceptions which may or may not happen, and it doesn't even tell you about it, except in the docs, which you, you're not going to read anyway. Um, but in Swift, there's no exception, because all these things are statically excluded, and that's due to the types. OK, I'm nearly running out of time, so I want to conclude um, by um, saying a little bit about the ecosystem. Um, and I want to start with memory management, because there's surprise here. Um, Swift cares about, I, I said that a few times now, right? And we're trying to make things small and fast and run on mobile devices, maybe with embedded devices. So the allocation latency is important. Um, Apple experimented with, with stop and copy garbage collection. Two versions of SDKs had an experimental version of it. They threw it out again. This was for Objective-C. Why? Because this was relatively early iPhones. And iPhones always had a very high resolution screen, uh, but very little memory. If you had three background images in your memory at once, the app would crash because it runs out of memory. So what's super important, if you deallocate a pointer to an image, this thing <coughs> has to go away right away, because you load another image and you can't have two memory. And with um, stop and copy collector, you just get uh, allocation latent, deallocation latency um, on finalization. And the other one is stop the word pauses. That's not always relevant, but I like to um, suggest, now, now these slides will be online, then you can see this. Uh, but Miguel de Icaza is the guy who did GNOME, he did Mono, C Sharp open source, and he's now doing Swift. Moved away from C Sharp, why? Because of this. And he explained it in this talk. Godot is a replay, open source replacement for Unity, the game engine. And they just found it's, it's, they couldn't make it work uh, without problems in, in those games people were writing. Um, very, I highly recommend this, this talk. So, Swift uses reference counting, not uh, stop and copy. And in the last two versions, it started to add uh, support for ownership types, Rust style, which you don't have to use. This you have to use. But uh, it's um, for embedded systems, it's, it's useful. And there's a nice blog post, uh, uh, very recent, where they wrote um, some for little mini handheld. Um, uh, which has very constrained memory and processor, uh, at, at some kind of ported the Swift tool chain to this thing. And um, there's a standard example which comes with this thing, it's written C, uh, which has like 904 bytes. And the Swift version, it's for Game of Life, comes in at 788 bytes. Yeah. Now, I showed you how what level of fraction this language supports, and we are talking about under one kilobyte kind of running software. I mean, in, in, in Haskell you don't even get the, I don't know what, <laughs> <laughs> entry into the runtime system for, for that many bytes. Um, as I said, it's a cross-platform system based on LLVM 2 chain, running on all the standard uh, operating systems. It has package manager. It's quite nice. If you use Cabal, then this thing is going to make you smile. Uh, very <laughs> simple. It has packages as Git repositories, package specifications written in Swift themselves. That's what you would do, like embedded language um, style. And um, yeah, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's great. Um, Swift evolution is an open process. It's a little bit like the THC steering committee with people around discussing and so on. Everybody can contribute. It's not just an Apple thing. So if this made you kind of like, maybe it's not so bad, then head over to <laughs> Swift.org and give it a try. Thank you very much. So yeah, we have a few minutes left for questions, so do you just want to pick? Yes, thanks for the talk, great. Uh, I had a question about the syntax that you use for establishing type equalities <coughs> within a protocol constraint. Yeah. Is the way out. Yeah, so instead of using the word clause, is there a reason that the, the protocol is set in itself is not parameterizable there, like with brackets, like you would do with the annotations or with the annotations of protocol parameters? Like, why prefer that thing? With, for because example, it's about quality there. So actually, so there are basically two types 
uh, of constraints you put into, into protocols. Um, that's subtype const or subtype or sub protocol constraints, and they're equality constraints. And um, with the subtyping constraints, you usually can choose. You can often, you can, in the square brackets, you can just colo type colon and then the protocol type, you yeah. want to have the subtype constraint on. Um, but you could, can also use the where notation. Both is fine. It's okay. just up to personal preference. Right. But with equality constraints, Usually you have to use the where syntax because the subtype they are always asymmetric, right? Um, mm. And you you can use them in the binding position in the position where you introduce the new type of which on which you impose the subtype constraint. Whereas because equality is symmetric, so you don't want it at the syntactically it doesn't look nice to have it in the introduction position mm. of one of the type variables, but I'm not saying it would be impossible, but again, language designers decided yeah. this looks funny. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you didn't do that, then like what I, what I find a little strange is that I don't know what are the, the types I'm constraining on on the protocol that I am sub-protocoling from. Yeah. So then I sort of have to go to that protocol instead of enforcing like, okay, you'll have two parameters. But I understand. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking mm, one more question. You said the word type many times today, but I did not hear the word kind even once. Yeah, uh, <laughs> very clever. <laughs> no, it's not higher kind. Okay. Um, that's the big omission. It's on the list, on the to-do list. Um, and for those people who uh, maybe uh, so so they, some language like Haskell or like the hardcore function language, they allow higher kind so that you can explicitly have. Um, uh, mappings from types to types and characterization sets of types of types and they are usually called, often called kinds. And um, for Haskell it's very important in order to have classes over monads and things like that. There's actually a way, so in many cases where you use higher kinded protocols, would you use higher kind, you can instead use an associated type. And uh, there are like the internet is full of discussions which style is better. Um, uh, yeah, so it's on the list of things which was always planned but never happened so far. So that's how it is. What is ecosystem like beyond iOS? Like if I want to write a server application, do I find yeah. what there, server like um, I went very quickly over that because I was conscious of time. But there is this Swift server working group. Which, um, which is very serious. I mean, this is not just a bunch of people that came together and do it with something. They are actually very serious. Um, and I think, okay, well funded. And um, so a lot of the, the, let's say, library functionality, basic library functionality, which initially was only available for iOS and macOS, uh, is being rewritten. Um, is, so it's portable, so this is the foundation uh, framework. Which, um, and so this is mostly done now, and so it runs uh, exactly the same code, code runs on Linux as would run on iOS. Um, and the server working group, they also have some web frameworks and all the corresponding networking libraries and all the things you would usually expect for server-side development, um, which are being developed. Uh, and are already, I mean, it's not, this is still an effort which is maybe five years, six years old, so it's, you don't have the variety that you get in uh, Ruby or something like that, but uh, I think it's already ready for, serial, for production use. Yeah. And cross-compiling is very easy because it's all based on LLVM, and LLVM is uh, very portable. Um, the whole, the tooling, also the source code debugger and everything is just, um, you can just cross compile. Oh, you can use on the very same one. All right, I'm afraid we're out of time. Maybe you will take questions later. Yeah, I'm or? around okay. for the rest uh, of the conference. So if you want to know anything about Swift, uh, please let me know. I put up the slides for the links, and yeah, and otherwise you can also find me here if you want to ask anything after the conference.